Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Napon Jatusipitak, and I'm a visiting fellow at ICS. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our panel on the Philippines and Thailand, Enduring Elites and Deepening Dilemmas. I'm a political scientist, and whenever I see the Philippines and Thailand together on the same panel or on the same paper, it's never about anything good. Uh, it's always about inequality, uh, money politics, failed democracies, weak states, and political dynasties. It's almost like we are the evil twins of Southeast Asia or something. And who knows, maybe Indonesia will join us next year. <laughs> <laughs> but all jokes aside, recent developments in Thailand and in the Philippines have shown us that uh, both countries are confronting problems that are not only unique to their own circumstances, but also con confronting common challenges, especially in terms of making democracy work not only for political elites, but also for the vast majority of citizens who will place their trust in their leaders and in their political systems, no matter how flawed the system may be. Today, I would like to introduce you to our speakers who will shed further light on these issues and beyond. On my right uh, is Dr. Anderson Unno, an associate professor at Thammasat University's Faculty of Sociology and Anthropology, where he served as a dean from 2013 to 2019. He received a PhD in anthropology from U the University of Washington. He has researched and published works on Malay Muslims of Southern Thailand, Thai politics, and social movements and youth movements in Thailand. Marites Vituk is a leading Filipino investigative journalist and editor at large at Rappler. She is also a prolific author. Her latest book, Rock Solid, How the Philippines Won Its Maritime Case Against China, won the National Book Award. She has also written extensively about maritime issues and regional order and awarded prestigious fellowships at academic and research institutions uh, around the world. Thank you very much for joining us, Marites and Adan Anderson. Uh, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Marites to the podium. Hi, <clears throat> good afternoon. Uh, I will speak uh, I will share my thoughts on the outlook for the Philippines in 2024 under the presidency of Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Unavoidably, I will have to compare him to his predecessor, Rodrigo Duterte, who was president from 2016 to 2022. So this will help us appreciate the changes that have been taking place since Marcos Jr. became president in July 2022. So here's the flow of my talk. First, I'll give a bit of background to provide context. Second, I will discuss consequential changes under Marcos. Third, I will talk about domestic politics. So Marcos Jr., the son and namesake of the late dictator, won the country's presidency by a landslide 36 years after his family was ousted by the People Power Revolution in 1986. Marcos won around 60% of the vote, giving him the strongest mandate for president since his father's rule. It was a dramatic reversal of fortunes, a triumphant comeback for a family that was hounded by court cases from stolen wealth and corruption to human rights violations. By the time Marcos Jr. ran for president, the grounds had been softened by fading memories of martial law under his father as a new generation of voters had surfaced. The persistent inequality and perceived failure of democratic reforms led to disillusionment with liberal democratic regimes from 1986 to 2016, beginning with President Corazon Aquino to her son, Benigno Aquino III. So after 30 years of liberal democracy, book ended by the Aquinos, Filipinos voted for a leader with a strong authoritarian streak in 2016. Duterte unleashed state-sanctioned violence against suspected drug users, resulting in killing of thousands. He trashed the rule of law, resorting to extrajudicial killings, the centerpiece of his rule. He sent an outspoken critic, then Senator Laila de Lima, to jail on trumped up charges. He intimidated and threatened the press, even shutting down a major TV radio network. 
In foreign policy, he embraced China, shelving a historic victory of the Philippines on the South China Sea. China refused to recognize the decision of an international arbitration court that declared its nine dash line claim illegal. Despite Duterte's pivot to Beijing, the Chinese Coast Guard and maritime militia continued to intrude into Philippine waters, shadowing our Navy and Coast Guard ships, blocking resupply missions to Second Thomas Shoal in the West Philippine Sea, and even firing water cannon. The skirmishes that have been reported in the past year under Marcos are not new. In a way, Duterte helped pave the way for the victory of Marcos Jr. The young Marcos was seen to continue Duterte's authoritarian rule. This was fueled by a sense of false or manufactured nostalgia based on a deluge of disinformation that painted the years of the strongman Marcos as the golden age of the economy. The other factor was Duterte's popularity. He is the only Philippine president in recent history to maintain high approval ratings this, till his last year in office. This popularity helped Marcos Jr., who ran with his daughter, Sarah, as his vice presidential candidate. Their team was formidable, scions of former strongman presidents, children of well-entrenched political dynasties, backed by money and political clans. Now on the first consequential change. Many in the Philippines have been pleasantly surprised to find out that Marcos Jr. is not two things. First, he is not like his dictator father. Second, he is not the continuity of Duterte's rule. Under Marcos Jr., the country has seen consequential changes on two fronts. First, he has restored normalcy in our democracy, no matter how flawed. As he tries to redeem his family name, he has vowed to uphold freedom of the press, human rights, and the rule of law, and respect the independence of the judiciary. On his watch, former Senator De Lima was released after close to seven years in detention. Marcus Jr. Has, approach, has changed the approach to the drug war away from state-sanctioned killings to rehabilitation. He has not intimidated or threatened the press. He has not publicly threatened the opposition and the businessmen. So we now have some breathing space, but a culture of impunity remains caused by a slow judicial system and a weak regard for the rule of law. The Philippines is also considering resuming membership in the International Criminal Court because under Duterte, we withdrew from the ICC over objections to investigate the bloody anti-drugs campaign. Today, the ICC continues its probe into Duterte's drug war. The second consequential change is in foreign policy. Marcos strengthened relations with the U.S. and traditional allies, veering away from Duterte's embrace of China. On the economic front, Manila is still part of Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative, but the Philippines withdrew its loan applications from China for three mega railway projects because of the absence of a response from China Exim Bank. Actually, the Duterte government also withdrew these loan applications during the last months of his presidency. For the same reason, there has been no response from China Exim Bank. Then the Marcos government reapplied but after months of waiting, also withdrew. However, today there are two ongoing China-funded infrastructure projects, both started during the previous administration. In 2018, Duterte, Manila and Beijing entered into an MOU on the BRI. This lapsed when Duterte's term ended, but Marcos renewed it when he visited Beijing in January last year. In the area of security, Two factors have put the Philippines on the map of like-minded countries, Marcos's foreign policy and our geography. We are close to Taiwan and the contentious waters of South China Sea. In this uncertain geopolitical environment, 
the US, Japan, Australia, to a certain extent Korea, and Europe have found the Philippines an indispensable ally. Still, China has accelerated its aggressive behavior in the West Philippine Sea. The Chinese Coast Guard and maritime militia have continued to shadow, harass, and even intimidate our Coast Guard, our Navy, and fishermen. President Marcos has been crowdsourcing answers and solutions to this precarious state, precarious situation. In his recent remarks, he said that the Philippines and other claimant countries should think of a new paradigm, should find a paradigm shift to de-escalate tension. So this is like Japan's quest for a solution to a very uh, dangerous problem. In the information space, China has been spreading disinformation in the Philippines using narratives that cast doubt on our alliance with the U.S., and on the abilities of the Coast Guard, which is on the front lines in protecting the West Philippine Sea. This appears to be China's response to the Marcos government's transparency initiative, making all encounters with China in the West Philippine Sea public. Our Coast Guard has been designated to report all this with photographs and videos. This is one marked difference from the Duterte administration which rarely reported on skirmishes with China. The Philippines has also stepped up security cooperation with its treaty ally, the U.S., and friendly countries. Under Marcos, the U.S. was granted access to four more Philippine bases in an agreement called EDCA, or Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. One of these bases is near the West Philippine Sea, and the others are not far from Taiwan. In September last year, Australia and the Philippines elevated its relations to a strategic partnership, the highest level of diplomatic relationship, and this prioritizes security cooperation. Australia is now the third strategic partner of the Philippines, the first two are Japan and Vietnam. As a result, Australia and the Philippines have conducted joint patrols with the Navy in the West Philippine Sea. It is the second country to do so. The U.S. and the Philippines were the first to do joint air and naval patrols in the area. Canada and the Philippines are set to sign an MOU on defense cooperation early this year. This could lead to a Visiting Forces Agreement, or VFA, similar to the ones the Philippines has with the U.S. and Australia. With Japan, a Reciprocal Access Agreement, or RAA, just like a VFA, is currently being negotiated. This follows Japan's signing of RAA with Australia and the U.K. in 2023. In Europe, Netherlands and France have been active in forging security cooperation with the Philippines. But Marcos faces a test in Philippine-China relations. Will he give the green light to a Philippine company to partner with a non-Chinese firm to explore for oil and gas in the West Philippine Sea? The Philippines faces a looming energy crisis, and China has always insisted on joint development or joint exploration with the Philippines on terms that are unacceptable to the Philippine government. China has stopped even previous surveys by a Philippine company. In December, during the Japan ASEAN Summit in Tokyo, Marcos said that Manila and Beijing are still in a deadlock over joint exploration talks. So let me turn to domestic politics. The disinformation machinery, which Marcos cleverly used before and during the election campaign in 2022, has splintered. However, state media and the social media accounts of government agencies promote Marcos and his programs. <clears throat> Outside of this, it's interesting to note that, that there have been several TikTok users and influencers, all of them young, who have produced content that promote government messages on inflation. Because inflation is a problem that hasn't gone away, 
and has affected popularity ratings of Marcos. For the long term, history books are the target. Our education department moved to change the term Dictadurang Marcos, Marcos Dictatorship, to simply Dictadura or Dictatorship. Removing the name of the dictator is a step to whitewash our history. But overall, there's still an active pro-Marcos network. The second issue in our domestic politics is the unraveling of the ruling coalition. As it is sound like Malaysia. <laughs> the team of Marcos and Sara Duterte won in 2022 on a platform of, guess what, unity. Thus, they called themselves the uni team. Mm. It was a hollow unity based on a short-term interest to win the elections. Marcos and Duterte belonged to different political parties, but they cobbled a coalition that brought together their own camps. Well, as you know, in the Philippines, political parties are vehicles of convenience. They are weak and fragile, and members of political parties gravitate to the party in power, leaving their former party emaciated. However, the unity of Marcos and Duterte turned out to be short-lived. Just a little after a year, a year after their victory, the unity team split. As they say in the Philippines, there's no such thing as forever. So the rumblings began when the old Duterte publicly criticized Marcos for his stance on China and the war on drugs. Of course, Manila being what it is, there were rumors of Duterte allies in Congress maneuvering to dislodge the House Speaker, Martin Romualdez, who is the first cousin of Marcos and a loyal ally. So, to get back at the Dutertes, Romualdez and the majority in Congress stripped Sara Duterte of her confidential and intelligence funds worth 650 million pesos, or about 11.5 million US dollars. You see, confidential and intelligence funds should only be allotted to the military and police agencies because they do active intelligence work. Well, of course, the president's office also has this fund. It was the old Duterte who abused this, giving himself billions of pesos, like US $81 million in intelligence funds in a year. So his daughter, Sarah, feeling entitled, wanted such funds for herself. After all, she's vice president and education secretary. In her first year in office, she was able to get these funds. But the next time around, Congress denied her request. Well, this was one case where infighting in politics or disunity led to a good thing. After her father's attacks on Marcos, Sara Duterte followed, publicly criticizing Marcos for entering into peace talks with the Communist Party of the Philippines, which has become a shadow of its old self. This was her first open criticism of Marcos. We will have our midterm elections in 2025. This would include the Senate and Congress. Will Marcos be able to get a majority in Congress and the 24-member Senate? This will likely be a contest between the Marcos and Duterte camps. Historically, however, midterm elections turn out in favor of the administration. So far, even if Marcos's approval rating went down to 68% in December last year, from a high of 80% in June last year, this was mainly due to the rise of inflation, he still enjoys a majority support. To conclude, overall under Marcos, we expect this democratic breathing space to continue, as well as the alliances and security cooperation with U.S., Japan, Australia, South Korea, and Canada. The search for a new paradigm to de-escalate tension in the South China Sea will continue. On domestic politics, we expect the split between the Duterte and Marcos camps to deepen. This will shape the political landscape leading to the 2025 elections. Thank you and looking forward to our conversation.
Thank you very much, Maritas. I think you have uh, given us a comprehensive and incisive assessment of the issues that the Philippines is grappling with. And now we'll switch gears and move on to Thailand. Uh, please <coughs> welcome Dr. Anuson Uno to the podium. Thank you, uh, Dr. Napoleon, for the you know, introduction. And good afternoon, everybody in this room. It's been a great honor you know, to like, uh, be invited to give a talk in this you know, forum, which is, I think, uh, very important. And yeah, admittedly, I feel a little bit excited because it is the first time that you know, I give a talk you know, like, among like, uh, various groups of you know, audiences. So you know, uh, I apologize in advance. And anyway, the second thing is uh, the thing that I cannot talk uh, is about, you know, the, like uh, something domestic rather than, you know, like uh, international or regional. So, you know, I, uh, I apologize in advance. But anyway, you know, uh, given that I was assigned to talk about the relationship, the, uh, the distrust, trust, and distrust between citizens and uh, the elites, I hope you know, the uh, Thailand case we contribute to the discussion of uh, on uh, the trust and distrust uh, between citizens and the elites. Why I say that? This is because uh, the notion of trust and distrust is central to Thai politics, you know, not only because, you know, it's like uh, crucial, you know, in terms of the relationship between citizens and the elites, but also among the elites themselves, which in effect, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, created like a political conflicts that we, Thailand's facing over the past two decades. And we also see the dynamics between trust and distrust, uh, between uh, citizens and uh, the elites. Uh, we need to, when we think about trust and distrust between citizens and the elite, uh, in particular, in the elites, we need to distinguish, in Thailand case, we need to distinguish between traditional elites and political elites or elected political elites. And this, you know, because uh, this dominated, you know, uh, Thai political history uh, since uh, the revolution in 1932, in which the absolute monarchy was theoretically replaced by democracy or particularly or specifically constitutional monarchy. And over the past almost one decade, Thailand's politics have been dominated by the competition between traditional elites and political elites which has the military as a decisive factor. And okay, we have seen like uh, the competition between traditional elites and political elites, you know, uh, for like uh, many decades. Anyway, uh, in the 1990s, it seems that the traditional elites represented by late King Pumipon had gained an upper hand. Culturally, he is regarded as like, maybe we can call him like a hegemon, who himself is also an intellectual, who produced a hegemony, which was able to combine or to unite different classes in society. For example, in the so-called people's grassroots movement or civil society or something, you know, his notion of self-sufficiency economy or the new theory in agriculture have been adopted by civil society. For example, you know, uh, there's the like, comparison between, like uh, previously, his notion of uh, sales of uh, uh, new theory in agriculture is not accepted by the uh, sustainable agriculture movement. Anyway, 
Eventually, it was adopted as a, a kind of sustainable agriculture. Likewise, his notion of self-sufficient economy previously or uh, originally was rejected by you know, in, uh, those who like, uh, promoted uh, community uh, economy. Um, in particular, for like a political uh, economy at uh, you know at Chulalongkorn University, he like uh, told me that you know uh, the king's notion of uh, self-sufficiency economy is comparable to his notion of uh, community economy or something like that. Okay, so we can see. You know, he's like a, you know, he like a, in the 1990s, he is regarded as a royal NGO, and also in terms of you know, uh, like uh, in politics, in particular, his relationship with the military, it seems like you know he like uh, uh, has control over the military, you know, which has like a general Bram Tinasulanon who's like, you know, already, you know, passed away. But at the moment, he was the chairperson of the Privy Council. He's like, you know, the right hand of the King Pumipon or something like that. So, we saw the culmination of traditional elites after, you know, like a several decades of competition, you know, coming as the one who's like a kind of, you know, hegemon. And... This is very interesting because he has like a cordial relationship with uh, the you know people's uh, sector or civil society, which in large part play a crucial role to the emergence of the 1997 Constitution, which was largely dubbed as people's constitution, given the fact that this is the first time that people had participated in drafting the constitution. But, you know, what happened is, this is for the first time too, that, you know, uh, the royal democracy or the Thai style democracy was written in the constitution as we saw in the Article 7, saying that if there are cases or matters that, you know, uh, have no like, reference in the Constitution, just deal with the case according to traditional governance. And this is very interesting because although this Constitution is designed, you know, to like, uh, uh, as like a one of the tools, one of the tools that like a, you know the traditional elites in collaboration with the uh, people sector, you know, in like a, you know take control over the you know politics. It also gave birth to a new challenger, which is you know former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, because. This constitution was designed to create a strong government. And ironically, he succeeded in using this constitution to enter politics in, you know, time 19 to, to, in 2001, he won the majority seats of the election and was able to form the coalition government. And in particular, two year, four years later, he won the majority seats of the election and was able to, for the first time in Thai political history, to form a single uh, political, a uh, single government, single uh, go party government. And this raised concern to the traditional elites as, you know, a threat. And it's very interesting because uh, this concern among the political uh, traditional elites had momentum in the people's sector. 
because you know in night in 2004 in 2005 there emerged a reactionary conservative movement called the PAD or People's Alliance for Democracy and you know what in 2005 uh, they demand for the returning of the prerogative to the king citing Article 7 in the Constitution. Although their request was declined by the king, the king instead told the Constitution Court to take care of the matter. And the Constitution Court was very quick to respond to the king's command. Two months, of, not, like, not, not more than one month, they gave a rule. The rule that you know uh, uh, the elections was you know nullified because you know it was held in secret, and it followed by the this you know like solution of, and this led to to the dead end of Thai politics, and which eventually led to you know the military coup in two thousand six. And it was interesting. Also, although you have uh, the citizens or active citizens at the moment, you know, in the in the yellow shirt, the political leaders also gain trust and or support by you know the, the other part of Thai society, which later is called the UDD, or the United Front of Democracy Against Dictatorship, or the Red Shirt. And the competition between the traditional elite plus the yellow shirt and the political elite plus the red shirt dominated <coughs> Thai politics more than 10 years. This also includes the emergence of the PDRC or the People's uh, Democratic Reform Committee, which also part of the yellow shirt. Anyway, uh, Thai politics, you know, took a new turn when we have a new political actor enter the scene, which is the youth or the younger generation. After the Constitutional Court ruled that the Future Forward Party disbanded and its executive banned from politics for 10 years, there emerged a youth movement in 2020. What is interesting is three of their demands. The most one is the reform of the monarchy. So they locate themselves or position themselves in opposition to traditional elites or the monarchy. Although none of their demands were met, their moves created a lot of impacts in Thai society. For example, 10 years ago, it's unimaginable that anyone, that no one stood still when the royal anthem was played in the movie theater. But now, it's like a, a common practice that no one, or that not like just only a few people stand still when the royal anthem was played in the movie theater. And also, we have a decreasing numbers of graduates uh, attend the commencement, which was you know, given by the family members, royal family members. And particularly, the result of the last election, in which the Move Forward Party won the majority seats in the election. Although they 
or their candidate nominates nominates you know, what does uh, support or endorsed by those in the parliaments, in particular the senators, because these senators were chosen by the you know uh, the coup. Uh, anyway, I think the last turn in the relationship between elites or citizens and Thai elites happened in August 22nd last year. Because in the early morning of August 22nd, Thaksin Shinawat, who left or fled Thailand for 15 years, returned. And the first thing that he did when he exited the gate is to pay respect to the pictures of the king and the queen before being brought to the court and then, you know, the, kept in the uh, prison just only one month. And in the afternoon of the second, of the 22nd of August is that. Uh, Setha Thavishin, who was nominated as the prime minister, was, you know, like endorsed by the, you know, more than enough voices in the parliament. And he became, you know, Thailand prime minister and up to date. So what we saw in two incidents on the 22nd of August is the reconciliation of traditional elites and political elite represented by Thaksin Chinewat and Thai Party. Anyway, this reconciliation or forced reconciliation created fragmentation among citizens. For the yellow shirt, many of them were upset, in particular, when Thaksin was granted or partly granted royal pardon, decreasing his jail term from eight years to one year. Many of them mourned on social media, posted that they are missing someone in heaven. For the Richard supporters, although some feel like a, you know, they don't like, you know, the way in which the poor type party, you know, uh, cooperated with the opposition, like a, the cool, you know, supported party. Still, they like a, can manage to accept this government. Just wait to see. And for the, like a, younger generation, they feel more distracted against the political party. So let me conclude with this. For the Thailand case, we can see that we cannot think about the elites as a homogeneous entity because there are different groups of elites or those in power, either, you know, traditional elites or political elites or business elites. And these elites compete with each other and sometimes they cooperate with each other and have effect with the citizens. And on the other hand, citizens are not just passive. If we take a look at the Future Forward Party and Move Forward Party, most of them were once citizens. Thanathorn Teng Lung Leung Kit was once an activist during the Red Shirt Rally and also who is now the leaders of the Move Forward Party, Shaitawat, he also an activist during the Red Shirt 
rally. So we can see how citizens or citizens are uh, penetrate in the political realm. So there's nothing easy between like homogeneous elite and homogeneous citizen. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Andersson, for your analysis of the evolution of elites and, and citizens in Thailand. Uh, there's a lot to unpack, but so little time, so I understand. Uh, we'll now move into Q&A, and I would like to exercise my privilege as the moderator and ask the first question. In Thailand and the Philippines, we have seen the formation of controversial alliances between old elites and populist challengers that has more or less redefined the political landscape in both countries. So in the Philippines, I'm referring to the dynastic alliance between Marcos and Duterte. And in Thailand, I'm referring to the unexpected alliance between the Pure Thai Party and pro-establishment forces. So my question to both of you is this. Do these alliances represent short-term marriages of convenience based solely on the sharing of power and patronage and nothing more? Or do they hint at an elite protection pact, to borrow Dan Slater's term? Can we expect these alliances to stand the test of times and crisis? as well as any bottom-up pressure for further democratization. Um, would you like to go first, Marites? Yeah, I think as I mentioned earlier, the partnership or the coalition between uh, the Marcos and Duterte camps uh, has already broken. So we don't expect this to be of a long-term uh, partnership. And they are not definitely, uh, they don't represent uh, something good or um, an agenda that has the national interest at heart. So it's really politics and who gets to uh, control uh, the Senate, the House, and who runs the government. Uh, it's just, it just so happens that uh, Marcos has moved to the center and the Duterte's have moved to the right. So we're seeing uh, a shift here. Okay, wishful thinking. I want it to be like a, a short term or temporary uh, reconciliation, you know, among the elites. But in reality, I think it's gonna be with Thai politics not less than 10 years. Because of what? On the one hand, we saw like uh, the culmination again of traditional elite but with a di very, very different strategy when compared to the culmination of King Pumipon hegemony. <laughs> King Vashirabu, or King Vashirangan, I'm sorry. King Vashirangan doesn't use anything like his father did. But what he did in like a maybe short term, is effective. On the one hand, the dissidents, in particular, the youth or the younger generation, many of whom are my students, they learned the lesson and they are aware that to tackle the issue, in particular, the monarchy issue, is not the thing that's as easy as that they think. So now they're like, a, you know, like a back to, you know, like a where they are before and then they think how to launch a, like a different strategy to do that. And the other thing, I think King Wachira God, he gains the upper hand in particular over the military. Why? Because the coup makers, two of them, General Bawit and General Bayut, we can see how they are for now. General Bayut, he has no power at all. And now, and two weeks or three weeks ago, he was appointed as a PV counselor. And his job is just like uh, to do 
on behalf of the king. If you watch, you know, the television news uh, at nine or two o'clock, uh, eight o'clock at night, you can see on the one hand you have, you know, the activities that the royal family members do on the day. At the other hand, or more than half of the news are about how the privy councillors do activities on behalf of the king. So now, one of the two makers, two makers was like, you know, uh, recruited as part of the king's, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, tools. And the privy counselor, privy council, will be a very, very crucial tool for King Vashiriya God, you know, to uh, remain in power. And for General Brewitt, last year, he, you know, hardly, uh, seen, you know, in public. He just like gave an interview last, uh, in, the, the, um, in December. And last week, he like, a, you know, uh, began to uh, exercise his, you know, role in politics again. But anyway, it's like, a, it's not likely that he will succeed in politics. So, I mean, after they use the military as a decisive tool to regain power, now those who have been used, you know, have been like a lift, and now they have like a new, a new proxy, maybe, mm. put a party. Okay, um, let's now open the floor for questions from the audience. Please keep your questions short and tell us a bit about who you are. Um, yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Rish, uh, postgraduate in international relations. Just a quick one. Uh, congratulations, uh, questions on Philippines. Congratulations that Philippines was able to overcome the... Uh, can, can, can you be a, a little slower? Okay. Um, well, basically, um, on the SES issue, uh, South China Sea, right? Uh, the new leadership in Philippines has increased its assertiveness. Uh, it's important to note that the world is watching Philippines-China relations. A favorable outcome would mean that other states can adopt similar models, and unfavorable outcomes such as a military escalation will only distance ASEAN and China on the SES issue. What is the current leadership's strategic approach with China on this? Is it friends with benefits, boundaries, or just neighboring countries fighting over sovereignty of South China Sea? I, it's it's yeah, very it's difficult so to, to, to hear. It's yeah. very hard. Maybe for you. I, but it's concerning the, the South China Sea. South yeah. China Sea, I think. Uh, can you? What? We can uh, collect them all. Yeah. Um, the question is What is the current leadership's strategic approach with China on South China Sea? Mm. Okay. Oh, what uh, is the Philippines' current approach to the South China Sea question? Yes. Okay. 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 Um, uh, it's several. We, uh, Philippines has been doing what it has been doing in the past years. Uh, bilateral consultations, the dialogue is always open. Number two, the Philippines will not stop asserting its sovereign rights and will continue to keep making uh, skirmishes public. Uh, number three, there's the ASEAN China Code of Conduct, but it's been taking forever, so apparently the it was Marcos himself who said that it's been going nowhere. So we're still using traditional diplomatic tools. Um, I don't know if there's a new approach, but the, the Philippines and Beijing, Manila and Beijing tried to have a hotline, but at one point our foreign ministry said no one was picking up from Beijing. This was during one of the skirmishes. So. We just continue the dialogue. In fact, we will have a bilateral consultation, I think, this month in Manila or Beijing. Uh, it's just to keep the temperature down. It's just to keep talking. But really, uh, Beijing will not give up until, uh, I think the design there is for the Philippines to uh, wear itself out, get tired, and just this, um, leave this decrepit, sh decrepit ship 
on second Thomas Shoal, uh, but that's not going to happen. So yeah, we're in search of a, the president said, uh, we're in search of a, a paradigm shift. Thank you, okay. Oh, I forgot to mention, of course, is the, always the search for international support. That's why the Philippines makes it public. Yeah. Okay, um, let's take a batch of questions. I see many hands going around. Let's hear from um, Kyrie first. Uh, Duncan. Thanks so much, uh, Duncan McCargo from Nanyang Technological University. Ajahn Anderson's fascinating presentation. I wanted to draw you out a little bit more. I think you maybe started answering my question after I stood up to ask it. Who do you think won the election between the traditional elites and the political elites? Because I think a lot of people might have had the impression that the traditional elites the network monarchy, the establishment, whatever you want to call it, was kind of forced to take an elected prime minister like Seta by the circumstances of the election. But you're, you seem to be hinting at a different explanation, which is actually that the, the traditional elites <coughs> wanted it this way. They, they won, they triumphed, and this government is exactly what the traditional elites want. Is, is that what you're arguing, or could you just elaborate on what, what your exact position is and who won the election between the two contending elites? Yes, uh, Kyrie. Yeah, thanks, Nafon. I'm just going to tag a question onto that on Thailand as well. Uh, this is to Anason. Um, you spoke very eloquently about distrust of elites, both elites, traditional as well as political elites. And you work with a lot of students in your university. Now, why should a young <coughs> Thai person bother <coughs> to vote at the next election when it doesn't matter? Peter won the election. He won 151 seats. He should have become prime minister. Two elites whom you documented the history of rivalry teamed up and ensured that the voice of the youth were denied. So what happens to this idealism of young voters who moved for a new Thailand? Um, do we have a question for, for the Philippines as well? Yes, Ajahn Thank you, Dr. I'm Tham Sak from the Thailand study program of the ISEAS, an international question for Ajahn Anuson. <laughs> Thailand and Philippines were both treaty allies of the US. Actually, Thailand is a non-NATO ally. But my question is, where do you think Thailand is in the US-China strategic competition mm. when the Royal Thai Navy wanted to buy submarines from China. What is the message that the Royal Thai Navy is sending? Is there any strategic message? Or is the Thai Navy just trying to confuse everyone? <laughs> I think all three questions were focused on Thailand, Somebody but let's, let's get uh, Anderson to... Sorry. Yep. Hey, can I ask oh, one more for the yes. Philippines? Sorry, Lorraine Salazar. Yes. Um, a question on the Philippines. Marites, thank you so much um, for an insightful <clears throat> presentation. Um, you mentioned in domestic politics that the upcoming election 2025 would essentially be a unity team, Sara Duterte versus Marcos um, competition, right? Is there, what are the prospects of other candidates, liberal democratic candidates? Is there a possibility of local politicians, you know, coming up nationally between now and 2025 and potentially 2028? Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't know what's on. Okay, first of all, thank you, John Duncan, for the question. Um, my assessment for the result of the election, and in particular, uh, the appointment of the Prime Minister, Seta, she talks, uh, uh, takes up the reason. I think this is a royally endorsed, if not appointed, government or the Prime Minister. Um, this is, a, this is a close meeting. I interviewed <laughs> some of ministers, this current one in the cabinet. Before the name, said, name of Seta was dominated, Thaksin's daughters, Patong Tan, and also her brother, was called to you know, uh, meet with the traditional elites. 
telling them that there's no way that the move forward party will be the government and there's no way that anyone nominated by the move forward party will be you know endorsed that's why they need to nominate seta and the reason why patong tan was not nominated partly has something to do with the concern of Thaksin as a father. He is not ready to have his daughter to compete with a very, very tough you know, political competition for now. That's the thing. And you know what happened after that? We have the first civilian who is not a prime minister as the minister of defense minister. This is for the first time. And uh, the defense minister, he has you know, no background in the military at all. But for this political you know, game, he was chosen. And it was interesting because now he has a very, very cordial relationship with the military. And it's very interesting. This is for the first time too. All the top brass from the army, from the navy, from the you know, Royal Air Forces, plus you know, the uh, police chief, they met the prime minister and gave him a well wishes for the New Year's if This is for the first time. And what is more interesting is after Seta was nominated as the Prime Minister, he was invited to join a dinner with the multi-billion guys in Thailand, many of whom <coughs> at least kept the distance from the Chinewat family. I asked and I interviewed some of those in the cabinet. I asked him if the prime minister was Patong Tan or someone in the Thaksin or in Chinewat family. Will this be possible? He said, yes, as long as it is not anyone from the Move Forward Party. Okay, so this is like a, you know, for like a, okay. That's why I call it like maybe the, the triumph of the mm. traditional elite, although with different means when compared to his father. And the second thing, why the younger generation bother to cast a ballot? in the election. Um, I taught students, I'm teaching students, you know, and for several times, they were upset with you know, what happened after the election. Still, they believe, they still believe <coughs> in electoral politics, at least they can voice their concern and what they want. And after the rise of the youth movement two years ago, they <coughs> came to be more aware that maybe the protest is not a possible way to, so, to change the regime. Maybe we need to think more about electoral politics. And now many of them joined the constitution drafting movement for the new one. So this is like a, there. This is what they learned from you know over the past like uh, 
two or three years. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Marites? Yeah. Just a short answer to Lorraine's question. The bad news is there is no alternative. We are going to have our presidential elections in 2028. Unfortunately, it's still going to be a battle between Marcos and Duterte camps. Sara, the vice president, is quite popular. Uh, we're not seeing anyone from the opposition, so that's their, their dilemma. So I, I think this will take a, a long time. We've had 30 years of liberal democracy, and now, I don't know, maybe we, we'll have just to wait it out, have strategic patience. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I think there was one last question that re remains unaddressed. It's by Ajahn Temsak about Thailand and the Navy. in the U.S.-China strategic alliance. Are we still have time? Uh, I'm sorry, we are out of time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, the way in which uh, the defense minister, Mr. Sutin, responds to the issue of the submarine purchase is not so much directed by the interest they have with the U.S. or, or, or the China. As the role of a civilian defense minister can play and the I think the emotion of Thai people, I think this is like a, maybe the, the first or the priority, the first priority that he gave when he deals with the issue. It's not about the relationship between China and Thailand when compared to, this is in my assessment, it's, it's not about the, uh, the interest between the two countries when compared to uh, the sentiment of the Thai people in general. And it's very interesting when we talk about China. You know what? It might not be only about the relationship between government and government, but I think what is more crucial is about the relationship between the business elites in China and Thailand. One of, or two of, the multi-billionaires <coughs> in the dinner with, say, Tata Wilson uh, from CPs or Jayavalanon's family, who is a Thai national, but his business is worldwide, in particular in China. So we have a link between Thailand and China, but not through the governments or the state and state, but I think between the business people or business circle. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we are at the end of our session. Please join me in thanking Marites and Dr. Anderson. Thank you very much.